How are you doing? Awesome, awesome. So uh, my name is Amir. I'm an associate professor of soil management and integrated cropping systems at Southern Illinois University. And today I'm going to talk about cover crops, especially cover crops in corn production systems, because that's a lot more challenging than having cover crops for soybean. And then I kind of uh, walk you through what we've, what we've been doing with cover crops and how did we end up doing precision planting of cover crops. Before I start, uh, there are a lot of gra graduate, undergraduate students involved that are, that are listed here in blue color and then so many people are involved in the projects that are being funded um, and so I want to acknowledge all of them and then also indicate that we are very lucky to work with Illinois Farm Bureau, Lauren Lurkings and uh, basically they've been very helpful and supportive of us. Um, we get funding from Illinois NREC, um, North Central there. We are part of um, Precision Sustainable Agriculture, which is a U.S. NIFA funded project and also Illinois Department of Agriculture. So I'd like to start with um, basically cover crops and what we, why we do cover crops and what kind of benefits we can get from them. Um, we did a survey and there are a lot of surveys out there that um, kind of ask why do we do cover crops and, and what is our main reason to do cover cropping? And a lot of times the response are always targeting at uh, reducing uh, basically erosion. And that's great because that means that the growers are really understanding that how invaluable that their topsoil is and that reducing erosion means that we're keeping that soil intact in our system to function for us the best. Um, we have Illinois nutrient loss reduction strategy. So we are in Illinois and their target is to reduce nutrient losses by 2025, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And uh, basically a lot of my research is targeted at nutrient cycling and then with the hope of um, reducing uh, basically nutrient losses and then capturing that nutrients and uh, basically finding ways that do not reduce yield while doing that. So I think if we want to advocate something, uh, we have to kind of understand that it's much easier for the growers to accept it if they see they're not at least uh, getting a yield penalty for implementing a practice that could be also environmentally beneficial. Um, along the way, as you do this uh, basically cover crop implementation, Depending on the basically crop biomass or res uh, residue, you, you will start like adding some benefits like organic matter to the system. Uh, adding organic matter to the system, especially like when we target like wheat suppression, when we have higher organic, basically uh, material input or plant biomass inputs, we are uh, basically adding more um, materials to the soil that would build soil organic matter. Building soil organic matter synergistically provide many other benefits, including like increasing infiltration and above all like resiliency to weather extremes that we are seeing. So basically high organic matter soils usually they have higher buffering capacity, meaning their resistance to change and that is very important in all these like erratic rainfall we get all of a sudden four inch, five inches of rain in a day. And that's, that's pretty important. One thing that is missing here is increasing yield. Sometimes cover crops can actually help us with increasing yield. For example, you can have scenarios of losing nitrogen and having something like a legume that adds nitrogen to the system can supplement what was lost and make sure that you don't lose yield. So this is the reason that why we do cover cropping. But to get the best of them, we need to implement them well. So uh, I, I work with John Pike and he always tell me, tell me that okay, cover crops goes, they go into your system. So you have to manage them as a system and then how you can manage them best to give you the benefits that we are looking for. These are the list of like five R's um, cover, cover crop managements, including right species. And then like a lot of times our options are cereals, um, legumes and brassicas and then uh, sometimes we mix them to see the benefits we're looking for. We have right seeding date, um, right seeding rate, 
uh, right planting methods. Um, so the planting method could be what we came up with this precision planting, but in reality it's like the normal planting, meaning either you go and drill or you um, now we basically spread uh, the seeds. You can use drones now nowadays. So many other ways that you can plant it, but like. To really get the seed soil contact, the best like drilling probably give you the best stand, and then um, then then that precision planting is basically based on a drilling method that is modified, and I'll, I'm gonna talk about like all of those and what we are doing and what we are finding, and then we have like termination time, and that termination times can vary from like really small uh, basically plants being terminated early all the way to like for example, a rye getting to a heading stage and then being like lignified and then basically try to get the best, for example, wheat suppression. That's you target for. And then like there are like tools like uh, basically I think there is one meat vest um, that basically cover crop tool that gives you uh, options to go and choose at what time, what species is the right and what seeding rate you can choose. Among these basically um, cover crop uh, management scenarios, one thing that is really known and it's really easy to target is, is that seeding date. And I'm not going to talk about it because it's really obvious. You go on time and plant the cover crops, they're going to give you a good benefit. You go late, you, get, you will get poor stand establishment. In some cases, you won't get any benefit, you just waste your money. And that becomes a very typical, like brassicas, for example. They usually, in our environment, winter kill. So if you plant them late, um, and then they have a very short growing period, and, and they're going to die. And so they're going to be small. They don't do any of the benefits you're looking for. If you plant them early, they're pretty amazing. Like they can grow well. They're huge. They can help you with your soil compaction capture nutrients and all of it. So I think seeding date is something that we know and that's something that like it's going to be less research on because of all the things we know. How we manage cover crops and also nutrient management, whether it's nitrogen fertilizer or manure or whatever uh, nitrogen source that we have will impact the components of nitrogen cycle. And especially what I'm really interested in, in this loop of mineralization, meaning the uh, basically organic and become basically available and, or the other way, immobilization, meaning available and become immobilized and not accessible but to the plant. And then all this process of nitrification that then goes to a leaching of nitrate, that is like one of the targets that we hope to avoid, or denitrification, which will become like a greenhouse gas. It's a pathway for nitrous oxide emission as a greenhouse gas. We can look at it another way. Is, uh, this is a Stanford equation for nitrogen management or nitrogen fertilizer recommendation. And this is a short uh, version of it. So you have N in the crop minus N that is in the soil divided the, by fertilizer efficiency. And then a uh, dot B yield came and kind of like expanded that soil N aspects of it, which is really uh, a lot of things we do with cover crops will influence this soil N. And at some extent, like also fertilizer efficiency with the nitrogen management. But so that, those soil and like you can see that they're like in organic and organic and involved. And then if you have like a cover crop, there will be like crop residue uh, that like become available very quickly or stays there for a while to become available. And then some, like if it's your adding your legume to the system that fixes nitrogen will add to the system. One thing they did not talk about is that sometimes that could change in another direction. For example, if you have a really high residue rye that immobilizes, in, and that means instead of like removing that from your crop need, 
that actually might end up adding some end to the system. You need to add more end to the system to compensate for what is being unavailable. This is an example of a serial rye. Um, so they're, they're basically yellow or orange uh, lines is how the corn is growing and taking up nitrogen. And then the green is how the cover crop, in this case serial rye, is decomposing and releasing into the system. And then so here you can see that like, this is an example of a Maryland coming from this cover crop and calculator. So, China, if you go to that calculator, give some information from your cover crop, the biomass of it, and some like your composition, it could kind of simulate what, what you're going to get from it. And then, so in this case, we have like 5,000 pounds of dry matter biomass. Carbon to nitrogen is 40. That means it's more than what we want in terms of like a C to N ratio to have mineralization of N rather than immobilization of it to some extent. Uh, so that, that, that number is, magic number is 25. And then here it shows that it has 65 pounds N per acre. That means the N in the plant was 1.3%. So you have your biomass times 1.3%, you'll end up with that 65 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And then it, it is literally telling you that uh, within six weeks after basically terminating that cover crop, you only got um, 30 pounds of it available to the corn. And then so the point is the synchrony of that rye with the corn is not great. The N, amount of N also being released is not, is not as good as you want to. Now I want to look, uh, show you another example, which is clover. This is crimson clover, and uh, you have kind of the same scenario. So the corn grows is the same. Uh, here you have 4,000 pounds per acre. That means that clover was really planted on time. You get such a biomass from a crimson clover. It's great. And then your C to N ratio is 13. That's a lot lower than 25. That means you expect that clover to quickly decompose and release N to the system. And then you have uh, basically 120 pounds of N per acre in that plant biomass. That means you probably had 3% nitrogen. That's what you expect. Your, your legumes, they usually have more N percent in them. If you get a biomass, that usually adds up to a lot more N in the plant. And then so here you can see like 85 pounds of that has been released by within that six weeks. That could be great or not great, depending on how you manage your nitrogen. If you go and front load N, for example, early in the season, and then you have 85 pounds on top of it, you're really exceeding what the crop can remove that early. And that could potentially lead to some leaching losses. If you account for that and think about, can I use that and synchronize that with my fertilization practice, maybe use citrus and later, when at like V6 of corner stage or even V8 corner stage, and then get that benefit of legume releasing again and then uh, citrus again when the corn really needs it, I think you'll get a better response in terms of production of the corn and decreasing nutrient losses that you might see in this scenario. So one of the questions we have is that, okay, so you have these legumes, cereals, and brassicas. Each of them give you something. Each of them, they have their challenges. And so you have to choose sometimes. So I talked to a lot of the growers. They would rather, for example, have a legume before corn because they are worried about yield penalty that a cereal rye, for example, give them. And that's, that's not desirable to them. Uh, on the other hand, legumes are harder to establish. Like you have to be on time to really establish a good legume. At the same time, uh, they will give you benefits of nitrogen. So that's what they love about 
And then if you don't manage that legion well, your uh, basically chances of unleashing is a lot higher. And that's like against what we hope to do in Illinois, getting the yields, but like reducing those losses. And then one thing is uh, that can be done is to like really account for that end and adjust for the end to that not having excess imbalances. What I mean by imbalance is like how much your corn is removing versus how much N is being added to the system, right? So difference will give you a balance. And a lot of times excess and balances means you had more applied than what the crop removed and that could potentially be lost to the environment. Uh, with the cereals, um, they're it's easy, you can even be late and still get a decent establishment with winter cereals, especially like rice, like grows literally everywhere. And then also we have to be careful. So if you have a rye in the system, you push it for a little bit of a later termination, that might lead to uh, your approach change in terms of how you manage nitrogen within that system because that could immobilize and you could then manipulate timing of your fertilization or amount of fertilization to kind of account for that change. So what we are seeing with the research we're doing with some uh, folks in, at SIU uh, is that like a lot of times when we have legumes, like we have soybeans, and then we have a legume on top of it to go before corn, right? So it's a corn soybean rotation. We are seeing increased leaching with legumes after soybean. And that is not what we hope to see. Anytime we had rye or wheat or a triticale, something like that, that captures that residual and from soybean, we are seeing reduction in leaching. But in the end, that becomes a challenge of, okay, if we have that cereal before corn, how can we manage this to make sure we do get those uh, environmental benefits, but not have yield penalty for the growers, so adopt it. And then brassicas, if you don't really get it on time, probably we shouldn't bother much, because we've done and we've got like very small plants that I think didn't do much for us. So, but if you get it on time, that's awesome. That's a good source to try. And here comes the mixture. So sometimes you will get benefits. You would basically manipulate the potentially negative effect of a rye by including a legume in the mixture. One thing that becomes tricky is how do we find the combination right? Because Getting that seeding rate right, these two compete, right? One, usually cereals are out competing the legumes, especially with crimson clover. How do we manipulate that seeding rate to get a combination that gives us the right C to N ratio and gives us uh, basically the biomass we are looking for with the N in it to synchronize with our crop production? So. Within that, we are a part of a 15 um, location, uh, basically a study. This is funded by USDA and IFA. Um, basically, what they're going to look at is look at uh, how these cover crops, meaning sea rye, a legume in some location, that's veg, hairy veg, and in some locations, like ores, is crimson clover before corn. And they want to know if the mixture of the two would benefit the corn in that rotation, and how would that compare to a no cover crop? So we basically look at, uh, uh, and then they have like a bunch of nitrogen rate trials to uh, basically see what is the response to nitrogen having those cover crops in the system. So they start from a fall, for example, the first year was fall 2020. It goes all the way to uh, May, a spring, uh, and then plant the corn goes all the way to the fall, and that will give you one cycle from one fall to the next fall. This is an example of cover crop biomass across all those locations that we had data for. The one in the red is ores, and you can see that so the, the right is the yellow, and green is legume or clover for ores, and then this is weeds. 
and you can see like as you had the rye in the system even in the mixture which we cut the rye biomass to half meaning we went from 60 pounds seeding rate to 30 pounds seeding rate but our clover was 25 and we cut it to just 20 still rye dominated that scenario so your whole biomass is mostly from rye than from clover and it's, it's in some places, it's way worse even. Here's an example, here's an example, here's an example. Some, they, the ones that they had wedge in it, it competes a lot better with rye than crimson clover. This is the response of like, uh, basically corn to nitrogen. So you can see the rye, and you can see like two things happen, one, um, the yields decreased to some extent, not much, but a little bit. Also, it needed less nitrogen as a result. So you, you got some yield cut, but also less nitrogen requirements there. When we did the mixture, that kind of went away. So that's one benefit of like in a, in incorporating that legume in the mixture, probably eliminated some potentially um, any mobilization that could happen by rye in that scenario. And then legumes and fallows were like kind of operating the same, probably because we didn't get a lot of legumes to really push for that excess benefit that we are hoping for. And I'll show you, it, they do benefit you when you're unlimited. That, that benefit goes away once you apply enough N. So it masks the N benefits from a legume once you have enough N by fertilizer. This is an example of like Illinois per se of those three sites. And I want to, you to look at the Wisconsin. You see literally no response, no response, no response, or very little response. And then a little bit more response. And that's also an example of N kind of N being a little bit tied up by, by why uh, and then uh, kind of being eliminated by having the mixture and then this is typical of Wisconsin because of so much uh, probably manure being applied in history of manure in the system that the response to N was in a good year that probably had a lot of mineralization was not seen. So one thing that I really like is to understand whether seeding grade that we are using 60 pounds all the way to like 90 pounds, <coughs> too much or too little, and how can we help um, growers to capture what they're looking for in a sense that reducing their production costs and in, in incorporating cover crops in the system. So in this case, this is um, winter rye. We chose five, four rates of 175, 50, and 30 pounds per year. And then we look at the biomass of rye within that system. And one thing you can see that the first one, that 100, is higher statistically than the 30 pounds per acre. They are all the same statistically. This is kind of higher in, in numerically, but it's statistically not. But if the goal is like with suppression, yeah, you want to go for a higher side. If the goal is nutrient, um, capture and cycling, not really, because take a look at here. This is nitrogen in the plant. Remember in the beginning I told you, when you do uh, basically calculating nitrogen in the plant is your biomass times N percent, right? That would give you this much N in the cover crop. You're, as you're increasing the seeding rate, probably you're capturing a little bit more um, biomass your N in the plant is reduced. Your plants are becoming more lignified. That means they're also becoming harder to decompose. When you put that together in terms of nitrogen uptake, they are all the same. So if the goal was to having more biomass for wheat suppression, higher N was better. But if the goal was capturing N, the lower side is better because lower seed cost for the growers getting the same benefit 
easier to plant into because it's a little bit of a less sparsy, light penetrates better, so a little bit warmer and it gives you all those benefits too. We also check whether, oh, if we try that with a hybrid rye, which is a bit more um, palatable, easy to decompose, um, a little bit aggressive rye, would that be different than a normal rye? And it, it wasn't, to be honest. So it gives you a little bit higher yield, but not necessarily higher, um, basically, benefit that you would hope to do that uh, with having a hybrid rye versus a local rye. So then these are like high and low rates. High means 90 pounds per acre and low means 60 pounds per acre. So 60 was fine and then didn't matter which one you choose. This is another one. We looked at termination data of wheat as a cover crop. So you can see here clearly we had a fallow ones that were terminated early, ones that we left that like to be terminated at planting, we call it planting green, and then ones that we actually went ahead and removed the residue. So we kind of like cut it and bailed it out. Interestingly, every time we did that residue removal, we ended up with corn stand reduction. That was significant. And we think what happened is that that corn starts bleeding, uh, basically uh, uh, allopathic exudates that will impact the population of corn and basically influence the uh, basically corn, corn production overall. That, that is significant enough that with no, no matter how much envy put on, we couldn't capture the yield penalty to match those three other treatments. This is the end. Uh, basically, in, in, in the growing seasons of corn, you can see that by having late terminated cover crops, in, in this case seri uh, wheat, um, you can see like the end in the system is lower in several um, basically occasions. But also, you can see that having that cover crop, especially that late terminated cover crop that is shown by green color, versus the red color, which is your uh, basically fallow treatment, every time the fallow treatment soil moisture is operating at the lowest level. Meaning, if you had a dry soil condition, that late terminated cover crop that caused a mat on the soil surface helped you and compensated for some of that end that was immobilized. So when we did actually manage that nitrogen by two by two by two star fertilization and split that end 100 pounds in the beginning, 100 pounds at cider's time, we matched the yield. We didn't lose any yield, which was very positive in that sense. When, so one of the things that we were worried about was that yield penalty by cereal cover crops. This is basically what we mean by precision planting. So think about the corn row. They are 30 inches apart. When you plant cover crops, they are seven and a half inches apart most of the time. Right, that's 19 centimeters. When we say precision planting, we are literally skipping that rye on the corn row, meaning we only have those three in the middle and nothing on the corn row. That reduces that interaction between the cover crop and the corn, giving that, cover, giving that corn a chance to basically not interfere with the roots, especially, or the residues of that vine, uh, of the cover crop, and then be able to perform better. And then you can man manipulate it in different ways. I'll show you some. This is a project that we are working on with Illinois Enrich. Uh, actually, Shalmer also just came in to see if we do 
precision planting, meaning that we do that, uh, skip that cone row, and you can see here, so there's nothing there, nothing there, that's where the cone row goes. Would that, first of all, provide the same benefit of a solid planting of rye, meaning every seven and a half inches? And it does, like every single site here we have, it either matched the biomass or increased the biomass because of like basically reducing the rate a little bit but uh, basically putting it all together in this section that kind of pushed the plants a little bit fight for being a little bit taller and they were taller a little bit every every time we got the same uh, basically biomass and then every time we matched the, the corn and uh, corn yield in that system. Only two times we did not. So only two times when we had a fallow, which is in that uh, white bars, we lost yield because we couldn't do two by two and fertilization. We didn't have the capacity in that side to do it. This is another example. Here I just compared these, uh, basically having a clover that is a skip row versus not having it. This is a mixture of those. You can see here is a mixture of multiple of these on, on the, all the rows versus having three on the cone rows and then having clover, sorry, clover on the cone rows and having rye in the middle. And it still didn't matter. So you're getting the same benefits and the same biomass by implementing it. And that's, I think that's awesome. That's going to help us a lot selling the idea of you can do cover cropping, not losing the cover crop biomass benefits, at the same time helping corn to, to basically cope better with, with, with having rye in the system to capture that nitrate for us. And you can see like here, also here, you have like skip rows and then that's the mixture scenario. Um, here, I just wanted to remember I told you like clover or clover skip row will benefit you, benefit the corn when N is limited. Here is an example. At the lower nitrogen rates, clovers always, always, we are talking about 15, 29, 23 bushel yield increase by having clover versus no cover crop in the system. <coughs> when the N was limited. That's N coming from clover. But once you go and, and give enough N to the corn by fertilizer, that benefit's gone. It might show up in your um, gray nitrogen content because plant doesn't understand, like it takes up N. But it uses in some of that N for yield gain. The rest of it will not give you more yield. Otherwise, we would always get a linear response to nitrogen fertilization. This is another one. This is a basically North Central Sare partnership grant. Uh, and then it's a bit complicated, but the goal was if we do annual rye grass uh, with cereal rye in mixture, and then only in the middle rows, and then having legumes on the side or nothing on the side, or oat radishes on the corn row, would we get the same, basically, cover crop benefits? And we did. So whether these are the VEG ones, so V stands for VEG, O, uh, basically, O means um, oat and radishes. And then you can see like that the biomasses were all, almost the same. The difference in this case was when you have clover with rye, you lost, uh, basically, clover in competition with rye. So the rye dominates your clover. When you had veg, that's the biomass of rye in the system, it's not the same. So veg really competed well with the rye, and that means you have more end in your scenario, plus uh, basically um, lower c ratio that hopefully will benefit your next crop. Well, it, didn't to some extent, only in this case, which is, wasn't a statistically did. And I think maybe we lost N in that scenario, or having that combination of oats 
and radishes on the Goro, plus which in the system benefited us, some, benefited us somehow that resulted in that sum uh, basically yield increase in that case, in that side here. And two, three more slides, and then I'm done. Um, this is the benefit of doing cover crop on uh, basically carbon, soil carbon. This is uh, basically looking at uh, permanganate oxidizable carbon uh, at the topsoil, and then going all the way to like a, a 90 centimeter depth or one foot deep. And then looking at also carbon stocks, um, after six years of cover cropping. And by having uh, cover crops, whether it's a uh, skip row or not a skip row, you are increasing carbon stocks in the system compared to a, a no cover crop scenario. So even within six years, it starts showing benefits. A lot of those benefits are way more um, easy to capture at the topsoil than the subsoil. This is another one. We look at the aggregate um, size distribution. That's usually we use that for um, wind erosion um, uh, benefits, and we didn't see any benefits there. But when we look at aggregate stability, we are seeing cover crop wines showing an improvement in aggregate stability. That means they're resistant to rainfall events, and they can hold their particles together. So overall, um, I think uh, basically legume cover crops could increase your yield, especially if you get rainfall events, scenarios that would really, or adjusting the nitrogen fertilization to give them opportunity to show their value to us. Um, and winter cover crops definitely capture soil land, but we have to understand they might cause any mobilization. We have to have a strategies of end management to make them work for farmers. And definitely implementing that a skip row or precision planting help with that. And then I think what we've seen all these side years, so like capturing what is the right nitrogen rate is very difficult. So I think we should really move towards a little bit of a precision uh, nitrogen management and then there are tools that we can capture and understand and predict and in the cover crops event with the models that I just showed you, then how much of that would be available to adjust or um, undergo management practices. And then overall, I think winter rise seeding rates of more than uh, 40, if the goal is not just with suppression, it's just waste of money. We can't really adjust the rates to capture whatever we, we want to get and then uh, be basically more economically viable for farmers. With that, I'd like to thank you for paying attention to me. Sorry, I went a little bit over time, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have.